Hey guys, uh, I'm Justin Hines. I work on the platform infrastructure team at BuzzFeed. I'm a software engineer. I'm at GP Hines on most things, GitHub, Twitter, if you want to check out my various social media accounts. This is also my uh, email address, justin.hines uh, at buzzfeed.com. Uh, to start off, I wanted to talk about a little bit about my team, the platform infrastructure. We have a very eloquent mission statement that I can never remember, um, but as the theme of it essentially is to empower our developers, um, which are our users, to deploy uh, more quickly and faster and better to production stage, be able to debug their applications quickly, um, get access to logging, get access to monitoring, and kind of this all like baked in and easy to use uh, platform. Uh, I like to think about platform infrastructure as a BuzzFeedy uh, BuzzFeed term, uh, delivery engineering, which I think Netflix has made popular. I think there's an O'Reilly book out there now on delivery engineering, and that's kind of the motto and manifesto of the platform infrastructure team. What I'll be talking today about and going over briefly is, uh, sorry, uh, oh, yeah, okay, my bad. Today, the, the, all something we're talking about is Rig. Rig is our complete platform for containerized services on Amazon ECS. Probably a key thing to note here, it's also a very opinionated platform. It's a, it's a platform that we built on top um, that prefers convention over configuration. Um, every service that we offer on, on Rig gets mapped one-to-one -to, -one to an Amazon ECS service. Um, every service is a top-level directory. Everything gets a service.yaml file, which kind of talks about your configuration, how we want to deploy your application, whether you want a load balancer or not, where your metrics are defined, where we want to uh, route your uh, alerts, whether you want to receive them on Slack or on PagerDuty or a variety of different other means. Uh, there's going to be a great talk in about, I don't know, half an hour talking about our transition um, away from our monolith architecture to microservices given by my colleague um, Will McCutcheon over there. Um, there's a great um, blog post out there called Deploy with Haste. If you just Google that, Deploy with Haste, written by our Vice President of Engineering, Matt Rieferson. It's a really great read talking about how we evolved our own architecture from a monolith to uh, microservices using RIG. But I can talk about where we are today. Um, we're fairly fully invested in Amazon ECS and our RIG abstraction layer on top. We have 16 months in production, 180 different users that have deployed to RIG, um, for, close to 40,000 employees now, over 400 services. Seven different, 70 different container instances, seven clusters that span two different regions. We have an average of about 180 deploys a day that go out. Um, and so we're talking about great scale and great mobility and quickness for our, our, our engineers. RIG, um, as an acronym, stands for RIG is great. What we also like to think about it as a backronym is RIG is glue. Um, so RIG really capitalizes the entire AWS ecosystem. Um, it's the whole platform. We have this load balancing layer that we will automatically provision for you. We use Elasticast data stores. Everything's, every cluster, it's in its own VPC. We have different workloads that we scale on auto scaling groups. Um, everything gets mapped to these EC, ECS containers, um, and then it's all kind of manually scheduled by an ECS schedule underneath. Target abstractions force consistency. So kind of what I wanted to talk about here on this slide is some things that have made us successful in using RIG. And that's really breaking down our layers of abstraction on top of ECS. So every service that we talked about gets mapped to a service.yaml file. You can see an example here. We have instances, various environments, CPU memory usage, um, different configuration details. Everything gets mapped automatically. Still mic up. Yeah, this power is the whole BuzzFeed infrastructure. Everything. Um, so we expect all our developers to be able to write 12-factor apps. So everything gets um, developers write logging to standard out, standard error, gets piped to our centralized logging system, gets routed through our syslog, ends up in paper trail. It's actually not a huge opinionated part of our platform. Paper trail is pluggable, and you can use something else that just speaks our syslog. Everything that we kind of believe in also is everything is self-service. We have a deploy UI. Deploy UI offers three different options. You pick the service you want to deploy, the version you want to deploy it to, the environment you want to deploy it to, and click the big deploy button. We have a rig data store UI where you can provision your databases. Um, we have RDS support right now. We're in the middle of adding Elastic Cache and S3 support to it. Um, and the new kind of really thing that I'm excited about is rig credentials UI. This will allow credentials to be fully self-service on our platform. You as a developer can visit the rig credentials UI, get an authorization token, access token, set up your two-factor off, revoke all your own tokens. Um, so that's going to be really exciting. I'm personally excited about that because I've helped enough users on board, and it gets a little old. 
But this land is obviously not all milk and roses. We've had certain challenges in scaling rig and kind of adopting new workflows. Um, as we've scaled, we started initially by migrating small, non-crucial applications to rig, and we eventually scaled up and started moving our entire infrastructure over. Um, so with this came a new services, new variety of workloads. We have a variety of different like queue readers that read off queuing infrastructure and perform large-scale data processing, um, new features. And so it's easy to kind of think about rig when you have this simplistic view of your architecture. You have a basic front-end service. You might have some basic back-end service. You might have some basic data store. They kind of exist in this availability zone, and that's kind of easy and trivial. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to start evolving rig and add features to put higher and more critical applications on our platform. And so what kind of makes that hard about ECS, as I mentioned earlier, is that a rig service maps one-to-one -to, -one to an ECS service. Um, and it's hard to break that barrier. We also have, um, so kind of as a motivating example, we have this routing layer that we have on top. So when you visit buzzfeed.com um, and you visit different pages, each page might be rendered by 12 different microservices on the back end. We have a recommendation system. We have a B page. Kind of your sidebars are all kind of generated by different, different microservices. In order to do that, in order to get comfort in moving the routing layer to rig, something that we had to do is think about how we wanted to add deployments on rig. ECS platform, when you go to an EDS, uh, deploy an ECS service, um, they have a feature which is rolling deployments behind the ELB, but this feature is almost implemented too well, and they roll your containers really quickly. And sometimes we want to be able to slowly and more methodically control and release a version, slowly scale it up to, to our larger percentage of our users. Um, so we started talking about this and thinking about implementation in RFCs. BuzzFeed has an RFC culture that we're start trying to start. Um, it's not the same RFC format that a variety of other like internet tasks force use. We've adopted a framework by Newton. Newton has a great blog post and a great template on what they use for their RFCs. Um, but it's a method for us to really kind of start digesting and understanding the problem that we want to solve and thinking about it from a higher level, right? In here, we talk about kind of our motivations and our background and kind of some of our key things that we want to solve by moving slower and more controlled deployments on top of the rig platform. And so we, we, we had the discussion on this RFC, um, a lot of back and forth. I think there are a variety of different ways that you can start thinking about slow and controlled deployments. Um, I think a really common one is canary versions of deployments, where you essentially deploy to one server or one small set of servers, um, verify your metrics and monitoring look okay on that one server before rolling it out to more instances. You have blue-green deployments. Blue-green deployments, you stand up a blue version of your kind of ecosystem, your stack, a green version of your ecosystem stack, and slowly route over traffic between, between the two different versions. Um, and you can deploy independently to one without affecting any of your users. Um, there's a third that people often use um, to enable kind of slow releases of code behind feature flags or A-B tests. Um, GitHub's really a fan of this uh, procedure. So is Etsy. Etsy really loves and GitHub really loved deploying dark features to production by and hiding everything behind feature flags. But so we have this kind of idea of we want to add these new layers of abstraction. We want to maybe add canary, uh, canary services. Maybe we want to add blue green deployments. And how do we do that? Um, ECS doesn't offer these natively on the ECS service. There's no like configuration to add a canary service. There's no configuration to add blue green deployments. And so how do we build these these kind of new abstractions on top of the underlying ECS primitive. And this is where levering, leveraging our applications, really uh, leveraging our different layers of abstraction has really come in handy for us. So within RIG, I like to think about it as three different layers of abstraction. We have our service.yaml file that developers use in the program. We have this RIG service uh, definition that's kind of this intermediary format that's defined at runtime. The RIG service definition will include a variety of different state chains that we want to perform to a variety of different resources. So I don't think you can see it on this slide here. Um, but we have things here like create DNS if we want to manually provision DNS for the service on deployment. Um, there's use load balancer of to define what load balancer we want to route this application to or via. And a variety of different other like tunables and configures that we can apply at deploy time. And all of that ultimately gets mapped to the ECS layer itself. Um, so here we have the ECS service definition, the ECS tax definition, and that kind of ends up being the ultimate representation of these underlying primitives. So we know that we want to start adding different flavors of our applications, right? We want to have our normal Corgi, and we want to have our brown Corgi versions of applications. 
um, we know we need to implement them as separate ECS services um, because ECS doesn't natively kind of support this different flavors or different tags or different uh, metadata applied to these uh, individual services. We started to develop this vocabulary around primary, non-primary. So primary is kind of like your default service instance, kind of your average thing that you go to deploy, the thing that is the default use case. Um, and we wanted to be able to deploy these different flavors of applications at deploy time. We didn't want to have our developers think about, okay, what new configuration do I need to add in order to leverage canary deployments or blue-green deployments or a variety of different things. We ultimately picked canary deployments for, for us, and so this is kind of like a basic architecture layout of how canary deployments look on rig. Um, we have our basic users. They call out to Route 53 DNS endpoints, get rounded to the ELB layer, that gets access to our VPC. Everything's in this auto-scaling group. Um, the colors didn't quite come out on this slide, but what we have here is we have three different Amazon EC2 instances. On top, we have our normal flavor of our application. We have our primary version of an application. And then we have this canary instance on, deployed on a different machine, but still being routed through the same ELB. And so what this does is this is actually a separate instance of an ECS service. Um, it is not the same primary ECS service. We define it differently, has a separate service definition, still has the same task definition, which is nice. Um, so they can be pretty flexible. Um, shared load balancer. Um, so we can see here, this is actually all the configuration overrides that we apply at deploy time for a Canary instance. It gets a deployment type of Canary, gets a new deployment, uh, new deployment name. We append Canary to the end of it, just kind of for readability. Um, and as well as isolation. Um, we don't create a new DNS record and we automatically set all our default instances to one. Um, something that we found actually in production is we decided to whitelist what applications you can use for carrying deployments. Um, we have a very large caching layer, CDN layer, that exists in front of our infrastructure. And we have found that it's hard for developers sometimes to figure out the right mechanisms to use. And we had an instance where a developer deployed a Canary version of a service that actually ended up in two different pages being cached at the edge and creating a fairly consistent view of some BuzzFeed pages. Um, something that's also a little awkward about these Canary deployments is traffic shaping is a little awkward. Because we're just adding one instance behind a load balancer, the amount of traffic that a single Canary instance gets is 1 over n, where n is the current number of containers deployed, plus 1, the new container instance. Um, so that can be a little awkward. If you're expecting like to deploy a Canary version of your instance, and you have this graph of it, and you can kind of see your metrics drop a little bit because you have this new instance kind of supporting traffic. And that can be a little awkward to explain to users. So here we have our deploy UI. This is how easy it is to deploy a Canary instance of your application and deploy to rig in general. You pick your service, you pick the version that you want to deploy, you pick the environment you want to deploy it to, click the Canary button, and hit deploy. Um, something else that we found as we started to add new workloads on top of ECS was resource contention. So rig right now, as you can kind of see from this one slide before, you have a single service that can be deployed to an environment and just one. You just have one instance of that one service and one version of that one service. But at BuzzFeed, we have applications that 30 developers might be working on. They might have 30 different commits that go in today. They might want to issue 30 different deploys. And we have a workflow that we encourage our developers to validate their changes in a staging environment. And so you have 30 different people who are trying to coordinate deploys to a single instance. And those 30 people might have stakeholders that they might have to talk to. They might have to talk to their designers, make sure those pages are being rendered correctly. QA needs to validate those changes and make sure they're OK. And this became a huge instance for us. We saw these big, long deploy queue lines, deploy trains going out of people trying to coordinate their changes on stage and kind of get in, in line. Yeah? So you said they would like overwrite each other? Yeah, they would overwrite each other because we only had one instance in an environment at a, at a time. Um, so again, we, we adopted this RFC framework, talked about it at length, talked about the implementation. We, we ended up um, stealing this idea from Kubernetes. Kubernetes offers different namespaces, which kind of offer you the ability to end up with different subclusters. So this is kind of the architecture of what a namespace deployment looks like on rig. You have your basic primary instance here before. You have the, this DNS hosted zone, your primary load balancers, your containers that exist on the primary service. But on top in green, we have this brand new set of resources that we provision at deployment time. You get a new DNS hosted zone um, for your namespace. You get a spe special namespace ELB and the namespace instance of your application. Um, we also have this brand new fully qualified domain 
um, service.namespace.environment.domain.tld, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, but what that ultimately translates to is that every single developer gets their own namespace at BuzzFeed, um, which acts as like a, their own staging environment, which is really handy. Because it's deployed in the same topology here to the same environment, they can utilize all the same stage resources, so developers don't have to worry about deploying kind of like the full stack. They don't have to worry about deploying all full 400 services in order to get BuzzFeed.com to render in their, in their namespace environment. Um, a challenge for us was also figuring out how to provision TLS and get TLS working in namespace environments. Um, we ended up going with our own custom certificate, so we run a custom uh, certificate authority. We, ACM offers the ability to uh, request free ACM certificates, um, but there's a bit of a latency by that, and you have to um, confirm the certificate over email, over SMTP, and we didn't want that latency introduced at deployment time. Um, we also use DNS Route 53 zones, and we also use these uh, Route 53 usable delegation sets. There, I haven't heard a lot of people talking about reusable delegation sets. They're actually a really handy feature where for new hosted zones, DNS hosted zones, you can specify what name servers you want to use, and that really helps us in kind of tracking, keeping track of different name source, namespaces, as well as adding white labeled uh, DNS servers and just getting DNS propagation down to a point where it's almost instantaneous. We have this rendering here again of the deploy UI, deploying into namespace as easy as clicking that checkbox and hitting the deploy button. Um, and not always do we want these, and not always do like these new deployment types on top of ECS come from our own desires, right? Canary deployment, sometimes Amazon releases really cool new stuff. Um, they launch Amazon ELBs, which solve a whole host and class of problems for us. Um, and so we leverage kind of the same underlying utility of deployment types to add uh, migration abilities. So migrations here are a little bit more complicated. Um, what we do is we spin up a whole new stack, kind of for the new migration service, similar to namespace environments, except with specific new temporary migration services. So we'll spin up the new LB, map them to this new migration service. Um, map, you know, you have the same existing uh, service here. Um, and then we convert these DNS records into weighted round robin records and use the weighted round robin records to slowly transition traffic over um, to the new migration service. But what you have is you kind of have this like temporary migration service. And so what we also do is we perform a hot spot behind it. So we'll tear down the existing primary service infrastructure, reprovision it, and then wire it up to the new ALB. Um, this is super convenient. The command lines to operate and do migrations is super easy. You literally have a start, set percentage, finish commands. We also have an autopilot, so you can just autopilot a migration. You give it a service that you want, a type of migration you want it to run what kind of like new load balancer configuration you want, and it will do it automatically for you. Um, it's also not all rainbows. There are certain shortcomings that we have on rig and ECS. Like we mentioned, the traffic shaping is still fairly simplistic. Um, it's still tied to ECS service names. You know, we still append dash dash canary, dash dash migration, all these things. Um, configuration overrides are a little awkward. I showed you that one block in the service.py file where we have the configuration overrides embedded in code. Um, that's still a little awkward for us, and we'd like to move away from that. And I think that kind of speaks to the last bullet point, where it's not a plug-in based model. It's still fairly inflexible. Adding a new deployment type takes writing new code, passing around these functions, and kind of defining this in actual code blocks, as opposed to something that could be a little bit more dynamic. I think in the future, we'd want to transition way into have you know, hundreds of different flavors of a given type of service and just implement them all with deployment types.